Let's continue our discussion of systems in the human body with the endocrine system. We'll start the lecture off by talking about mechanisms of hormone action. There are different divisions of hormones, and this is largely based on their chemical structure. The first one we'll discuss are peptide hormones, which are composed of amino acids and derived from larger precursors that are split up. Because they're peptide-based, they're polar and can pass through the plasma membrane without any assistance. They can bind to extracellular receptors and trigger secondary mes messenger cascades. This causes a signal cascade using molecules such as CAMP and GTP cascade me mix. These are rapid onset, but generally the response is short-lived. And since they're polar, they don't require carrier molecules to go through the bloodstream. Steroid hormones, on the other hand, are minimally polar, but enough so so that they can pass through the plasma membrane. They bind to intracellular or intranuclear receptors, and they can promote configurational changes. Since they can go into the nucleus, they can also bind to DNA, which can cause genetic um, signals and responses as well. Because these are a little bit different, they are slower onset, but the responses are longer lived and because they can't dissolve in the bloodstream, they're going to require some sort of carrier to get to the site that they need to. Amino acid derivative hormones are modified amino acids, so they're slightly different than the peptide hormones we talked about earlier. There's two types in particular, direct hormones and tropic hormones. The direct hormones trigger effects in non-endocrine tissues, whereas tropic hormones trigger effects in other endocrine tissues. These generally are derived from one or two amino acids with a couple additional modifications. An example of these are thyroid hormones, which are made from tyrosine with the addition of a couple iodines. Now that we've talked about the mechanisms of action, we're going to go into the endocrine organs and the subsequent hormones they release, along with the effects of these hormones. Before we can even go into anything regarding the endocrine system and glands, we have to talk about the hypothalamus, or the master gland. This bridges the nervous system and the endocrine system, and it's attached into the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. These two glands release certain hormones that trigger other responses in the body. So let's get started. If you remember from our lecture on reproduction, you'll remember what GnRH does. It releases FSH and LH. GHRH releases growth hormone, which is obviously going to stimulate growth throughout the body. TRH, or thyroid releasing hormone, is going to trigger st thyroid stimulating hormone in the thyroid. And CRF, or corticotropin releasing factor, is going to trigger adrenocorticotropic hormone. PIF, or dopamine, is going to inhibit the release of prolactin. And endorphins are involved in pain and euphoria. Generally speaking, when you have stimulating drugs, it's going to do something to endorphins to trigger pleasurable experiences. The posterior pituitary, on the other hand, triggers the release of ADH, or vasopressin, and oxytocin. ADH stimulates water retention in the kidneys, and oxytocin has been linked to childbirth, milk production, and testosterone production. But it's also been linked to affection, and in general, oxytocin has effects that are still not widely well understood. The thyroid gland regulates metabolism and basal metabolic rate using thyroxin, and the parathyroid gland increases blood calcium levels using PTH. This is going to decrease calcium excretion by the kidneys and stimulate the bones to reabsorb calcium and phosphorus. The adrenal cortex releases three hormones in particular. Glucocorticoids increase blood glucose levels and reduce protein synthesis. They also inhibit the immune system and participate in a stress response. ACTH released from the anterior pituitary is what's going to stimulate the release of glucocorticoids. There are a few types of mineral corticoids, but for the purpose of the MCAT, the only one that's really discussed is aldosterone, which promotes sodium uptake and thus increases water reabsorption. Aldosterone and ADH work together to improve our water retention rates. Lastly, cortical sex hormones, or testosterone and estrogen, produced by testes and ovaries respectively, are going to maintain sexual characteristics in individuals. The adrenal medulla releases catecholamines, commonly called epinephrine and norepinephrine. 
You're going to see these called colloquially as adrenaline, but that is a common name and not the scientific one. These participate in the fight or flight response and promote glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis to increase glucose concentrations for use by our muscles and the body. Because of this, they're going to increase the basal metabolic rate, heart rate, and the dilate the bronchi or alter blood flow in order to increase our performance temporarily under stress. The pancreas regulates glucose homeostasis. This gland in particular is going to be observing the glucose concentrations in our body and adjust it accordingly to maintain optimal function. This is done via glucagon and insulin. Glucagon raises blood glucose levels and stimulates glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Insulin, on the other hand, does the opposite effect, so these two hormones are antagonists to each other. Insulin decreases blood glucose levels and stimulates anabolic processes and glucose uptake in the cells. If you're diabetic, or know somebody that's diabetic, you'll probably note that they take insulin. This is because their body has difficulty uptaking glucose. For this reason, they have to inject insulin into themselves to help with this process. Somatostatin inhibits both insulin and glucagon secretion. The gonads maintain sexual characteristics for males, they re it's released from the testes, and this is produced in the form of testosterone. In females, it's released from the ovaries, producing estrogen and progesterone. This is crucial to maintain our sexual function and sexual characteristics. Note that males have trace amounts of estrogen and progesterone, and females have trace amounts of testosterone, though. The pineal gland releases melatonin, which regulates circadian rhythms. If you're having an irregular sleep cycle or staying awake for too long, you're going to notice that your mood and your body functions change. This is because your circadian rhythms are off, and your melatonin secretion is probably all sorts of in the weird places. The stomach and intestines release secretin, gastrin, and cholecystokinin. These are all involved in the digestion response when we eat. And the kidneys release erythropoietin which stimulates bone marrow to produce red blood cells. This is when the kidneys respond to low oxygen levels in the blood that it's filtering. The atria of the heart secretes ANP, which promotes excretion of salt and water in the kidneys. This is when the atria stretches too far and well beyond what it's supposed to, or a high blood volume. This is obviously dangerous because if the atria stretches too far, it's going to burst, which is obviously going to kill the individual unless surgically treated. The thymus releases thymus, thymosin, which promotes proper T-cell development and differentiation in our lim limbic system. As you can see, the human body is a very delicate balance, and to maintain homeostasis, it requires a lot of different hormones to regulate our responses. I hope this lecture has shown you how sensitive our bodies truly are, and how delicate the balance maintained is.